Aloha kakahi a kakako. Aloha. So startings and the endings are the hardest, so please bear with me. Um, o vao peliko kamana o io kukiaka vaili ula. O mana me kione kanio no hili kam oyanjare. It's a long one, it's a story, but we won't do that story today. Um, no hova iala, maeo, makikahi aina, ili, o piliamo o makamukupuni o kawai. And that's as much as we're going to go because I have a story to tell and I don't want to go on and on. I just want to thank everybody for having me here for the invitation, for Kelly to brought me into the network and Linda for all the work that you do and meeting with me and Zoom challenges. Um, but thank you each and every one of you for, for being here, for participating, for contributing to, to this journey that all of us are on in thriving and productive communities. Um, and I'm just gonna get going, if that's okay. So all of us have stories, all of us have a journey, and we take different roads, but the hope is we're all trying to get to the same place. Um, today I would like to share with you my story of Pilina, which are relationships, Peva, which are connectors, and Aino Momona, which I translate to be productive and thriving communities of people, place, and our natural resources. So we all have to have a why. And if you don't have a why, please go and find your why. Yeah. We have this thing that's happening in our world where we are fighting against things, right? Yeah. And what happens when we vision away from something, we forget that we have to vision towards something. And we get lost in the visioning. So if you know your why, we can still deal with the past, deal with the traumas, deal with the healing, as long as we know where we're going, instead of just pushing away from other things. So why? My why is Aina Momona. Alahula is this beautiful word that means a path well-traveled. So we wanna create a path well-traveled to Aina Momona, which loosely again is thriving and productive communities of people, place, and natural resources. Aina is a word, you have a similar word, kainga, here? Right, am I right? Um, and for us, and if you break the word apart, it means to feed, right? And in, our, in Hawaii, aina and feeding happen in reciprocity. So whatever can feed us, we have to be feeding it, and it's a circular thing, and it's a circular relationship. But it's all those things that not only feed our mouths, but feed us mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically. So I am an aina to my communities, to my family, to anyone I come across. And anyone I come across becomes my aina as well. And that feeding that I receive is dependent on the receiving that I give. I'm the feeding that I give, right? Our communities, our organizations, our lands, our oceans, our forests, our watersheds, our rivers, they're all aina and they feed in different ways. But they can only feed at the capacity in which we feed it. That's a beautiful relationship that we have with our places and our communities. Momona means fat. Yeah, fat. It's such a good word in, our, in Hawaiian, right? But productive. In order to be fat, you have to be productive and you have to be thriving and you have to be flourishing. So thriving and productive of people, of communities, of people and place. So the how, right? I got my why. And just let, to let everyone know that why didn't come immediately. It took years and years and years to even understand it. I knew what I was doing, but I didn't understand and I couldn't articulate it. So if we're not there yet, just know that look for your why. What are we doing this for? So Peva. Peva is my how and my what. So you guys know I'm woodwork, butterfly stitches in woodwork, right? And the function of Peva are to take fractures in wood, right? Clean out the fracture, insert a Peva, and you make something stronger, and you make it usable again, and actually more beautiful. Right? We have fractures in our communities. We have fractures in our forests, in our oceans, in our riverways. And do we want to make it pristine, or do we want to clean out the wound and insert peva? We have, peva, we have fractures in our communities. And so as we grow and as we heal, what I'm realizing in all of the conversations I'm having is that we have too much wedges. Can you guys reflect on that? How many of us are becoming wedges in our community? 
instead of Peva? How many of us are fracturing us more instead of joining us together? And I think 20, 30 years ago, we definitely might have need of those wedges. But I see in the, re in the world that I look at today, I see more Peva needed. So we have Peva of philosophy of, of thought, relationships, providing safe spaces, our leadership, service, and then we have the tangible pevas like my programs and the research that I do, which are Nakilo Aina, Naka, Pak, Huli'ia, and Ku'umu'olelo, which I'll talk a little bit about today. So Nakilo Aina. So you guys got Aina, right? All the things that feed us, well, we feed it, and that understanding. And so we have a traditional relationship with Aina, and that's reciprocity, but it's also familial. Right? And we are the youngest in this long line of family. Yeah, that's the relationship. Observers of the many things that feed us. You guys know this word, kilo, tiriro, tiro, tiro? And what does that mean to you guys in Modi? To look and to see. So I'm not going to tell you what it means for you, but what it means for us is everyone says that. But we have words for look and to see. Other words, like na, na. Ike. So what does kilo mean for us? And we've actually diluted our words. So this is where language and to dig into language is really, really important. Kilo for me is not a look-see. It is a process of observation to answer questions. Right? We have an inquiry. We see something. Put all the dots together and now we have to solve the problem or see the story. And for us, that's kilo. Right, there's an inquiry process happening, and I like to refer to it as our scientific method. Right? So how do we create observers of, of, our, of the things that feed us? How do we medicate? How do we diagnose? Well, we have to kilo first, because some medicines don't apply across the board, and we have to make sure we're giving the right medicine, because we're healers as well, if you really think about it. So the lessons. And a lot of the things that have brought me along this journey, and they're really, really simple, and that's the kind of thing. We don't have to complicate things. Pilina, relationships. This is the foundation of everything. We watch, we learn, we interact based on Pilina, relationships. How we see the world is based on our relationship to it. How we see each other, based on the relationship to it. So most of the work I do is we're actually working with people. I try not to as much as possible, but we have to, right? We're the problem. We are, so we gotta be the solution too. But how do I get myself to see myself clearly? How do I get to interact with people? What's that relationship look like? And then how do I get that relationship to expand into the world around us? And a lot of it has to do with the story of where you sit. Because if you can't see yourself in the story of the river, because you can't see yourself, then we have to do some work before we introduce you to the river. Yeah? Part of that relationship building is being present and paying attention. And somebody yesterday said this, and it's so simple, it's so, it becomes overly complicated, right? Relationships, pilina, determines how you are present and how you pay attention. So your relationship is the de determining factor of how you're there, right? We've been here for two days, one and a half days. Who can tell me the plant people in this space? Who is paying attention? And then who can tell me what those plant people are doing? Harakeke, their flowers are wilted. There's no flowers on the manuka. Potakawa, no flowers. There's something out there tasseling, something giving berries. I don't know all the names, sorry. I have to acquaint myself with your forest, right? The kawakawa outside where we eat the forekai is a little bit sad, yeah? So being present and paying attention, we're here, but how many of us are actually paying attention? And so that's a really big journey, so we have to broaden our relationships. And broadening relationships is in the doing. And Kelly mentioned this yesterday in her talk. Makahana ka'ike is a saying in Hawaii that we talk about in the, in the doing one knows. And there's this another beautiful kind of use of words, mana'o lana to mana'o i'o. Mana'o for us is ideas, concepts, Lana means to float. So the concepts around us that float, we talk about it a lot. That's academia, mostly, right? Valuable, super valuable, but we have to do it. Io means flesh. 
So we have to do these things that we talk about that float about us until it becomes a very part of our flesh. In Hawaiian, mana'olana means to hope. Mana'o'i'o means faith. And what is faith to us? It's our truth. The other truth thing, if you will, is realities. A lot of us, I'm going to assume, are in the business of management, right, and education, and policy, or being able to influence it. But if you don't understand what it means to bring food home and represent your community through the lenses of the paths that they walk, are we doing our communities justice? So I am not a fisherman, but I fish, and I can feed my family. I'm not a hunter, but I hunt, and I can feed my family. I'm not a farmer, but I farm, so I can feed my family and my community and contribute that way. But I'm not, not only for that, but to grow my relationships. So when I contribute to conversations, I am, it is my responsibility to make sure that the voices are represented in that conversation as closely as I can get it. And then here's the sticky one. And just a disclaimer, I'm the guy who looks at all the holes in, in our ship. And I talk about the elephant in the room. Yeah, knowledge systems. We always hear this. I've been hearing this for 20 years now. We need to take traditional knowledge and integrate it with Western science. The first thing is knowledge is a product of a science. Knowledge is a product of a system, which is determined by a relationship. So how do you take a product and insert it into a system? Or wouldn't it be more fair to say we want to take indigenous science and find ways to do Western institutional science, but not to do that, to help support the why. Make sense? So science does not belong to the West. STEM doesn't. Science, technology, engineering, math. We all had our own. And there are inquiry processes and there are tools to help us get to our whys. And understanding that knowledge is a product of a system and the system is not dead. And traditional knowledge is continually updated and revisited, continually, always, always, if we understand the science, the inquiry, and the kilo behind it. Again, the why. And the last is revisiting and redefining our narratives and beliefs. So what's the story and who does it belong to? Have we ever thought about that? We talk about healthy, first one. Look at the shoreline pictures that I have here. It's the, same, it's the same shoreline. Tell me, one, two, three, four. Hold up your hand. What's healthy? I got a two, 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 two. Okay, all four are healthy. Yeah? Trick question. Yeah? But if we don't understand that through seasons, we're going to look differently. Number two... It's not healthy, it's, it's lush. It's a different descriptor. But we look at the world through this lens and someone else's story of health. So what happens if I'm the manager of the shoreline and I have this story in my head and I gotta do something and I come in in three and I'm like, oh my gosh, something's happened. And I put all of these actions into place. What am I now doing? Am I making it better? No, I'm actually doing it worse, yeah? If I don't understand this intricate system that happens, smart, poor, disadvantaged, any grant writers, you guys have had these words before. Poor disadvantage kills me, by the way, because that's what mostly funds our people, right? Poor disadvantaged communities, here's some money. Go tell your community that they're poor and disadvantaged. Ugh, right? Productive. If I didn't do 20 reports last month, not productive. Well, guess what? My Netflix marathon, super productive. <laughs> Serious, right? Because we all look like this. This is us. Yeah? I need Netflix marathon when I'm one, by the way. Literacy and illiterate. We have this literacy kind of thing happening right now. Well, not now, forever. What is literacy? What is literacy? It's the ability to receive information, process it, and spit it back out. That's literacy. 
in its most simplistic form. So what's indigenous literacy? It's the ability to read our knowledge repositories, which don't come in books. They're actually embedded in our landscapes and our oceanscapes and our skyscapes. But can we read our libraries now? Because we've been following somebody else's story of literacy. So now we've become illiterate. And now the journey is becoming literate again. So here's a PEVA, a tangible PEVA that we've created about 15 years ago and we've refined and gone through Huli'ia and it helps us track seasons, it lets a place, our kupuna, right? Our elder siblings actually tell their story and we have to listen. Not through the biases that we like to bring with it, but as cleanly as possible. What are the clouds saying? Okay, what's the ocean saying? Okay, what's our birds saying? What is our plants saying? How do we read those libraries? And here's the thing where there's a conflict with Western systems. Everybody's doing it for the data, the data, 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 data. Which is cool, because it's a byproduct of this process. But guess who's the product? I know Momona, right? Productive communities. So you and me are the product of Huli'ia. Our ability to be conscious of place and each other being literate again, and to helping us redefine and relationship shifts. And that circular process, change your relationship, change how you watch, change the question, right? Change, 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 it all affects and it just keeps going and going and going. So we recalibrate to each other and the world around us and we start getting this beautiful story. Plants, certain plants are flowering, seeding, shoreline smells like limu or seaweed, right? We have gonads in some of our reef fish. And let's just another reminder, right? Products, knowledge is a product of a system. We're not supposed to see what our kupuna saw, but we're supposed to see how they saw. Because our world, like us, is a, should be changing. Sometimes we don't like the change, it's okay. But we should allow that story to be heard. We have a place in everywhere and three generations ago they no two generations ago they expect the wind to act a certain way and it used to have sugarcane fields before well they planted eucalyptus trees so there's a huge forest there now those winds no longer act the same if you don't understand that and you keep forcing those winds to act the same what happens we don't allow that place to now inform us of how we need to change our behavior to suit that so the rain doesn't come in the same way yeah, which affects what, what can grow, where it can grow, when it can be harvested, right? All of the things. We also have Olelo no Ea, and you guys have it too. I know it's Potukawa and Kena, right? The pairings. So we have that too. Palakahala, Momonakaha, Uki Uki is one of many, many, many as you have here. And again, I'm, knowledge is a product of a system. So our kupuna watched and they looked at indicators and they let that advise them, right? The literacy happen. But when is it no longer, when does it have to be updated? Is it still wisdom? Well, it isn't if you don't have hala in your backyard anymore. But here's a beautiful thing, there's something there telling that story. But if you're stuck on looking for hala, you're not gonna see the other story. Yeah, momona kaha uke uke, which is not kena, tastes way, way better, sorry. You have to come to Hawaii to see this, okay? <laughs> but come when the hala is fruiting. <laughs> so we've done this in several communities and right now we're working with about 20 something communities across our state and up in um, Vancouver actually. And in some communities here we've been able to touch and go with. But now how do we start to let our places tell its story and then get new knowledge that someone can reset in 10, 20, 30, 40 years to see if it's still true. Kepi ina nalu ulu papo haku, pulu ka papa ulu ka pahe'e. Pahe'e is like your um, paringo, did I say that right? Yeah? We have a smaller window than here and you need certain drivers to let that happen. But it's such a delicious um, seaweed for us. So we look forward to it. That's why we wrote about it, because it was important to us. Yeah, so we have this visual story and then in one of our atolls in the more, more northwest Hawaiian Islands, there's another story unfolding, right? When some of our flowers are going up, enough to cover the air in a sense. 
when our birds are starting to, um, to nest and fledge, when our shorelines are covered in seaweed and our migratory birds are coming through, right? All of those stories are indicators of another story. And if you can start to read that landscape, now we can inform our activities. And that's the broader one. And I really wanna see Kelly, your guys one, the, the 12 months together. I'm really excited about that. So we have Olelo no Eel, right? Again, context. Not Ole Kapo. So I've, we figured out seasons, right? Okay, we have to get to know seasons. What's happening in seasons? And then we have Maramataka, right? Our moon. Our, mood gu our moon guidance. Yeah? So here's the thing. Again, disclaimer. I'm the whole finder. Yeah? We have Olelo no Eel. Na Ole Kapo or na Ole Keao. He Ole Koloa. The nights are Ole. So we have our Ole moons. You guys have Ole moons too, right? How many of you guys were told that Ole Moons, you can't do anything? That's what the story is at home. I'm like, BS. Don't tell me what to do. And the explanation is the tide is high in the Ole period and no fish are caught. Well, I see different. So how do I take old knowledge, traditional old knowledge, and then look at my kupuna and look at my older siblings like the ocean and the reefs and the fish, that are telling me a, di a different story. And who am I gonna tell is wrong? Guess who I'm gonna tell is wrong? That. Because our oceans are telling us a different story. So I had to explore seasons and, and moon phases. And again, right, this is not saying it's wrong. It's maybe out of context, or we have to, re we just have to update, right? There's no wrong here. It's our journey. And these pictures are in Ole Moons, by the way. So we have an extreme high that's in, by the same wall that's underwater on the left. These are all Ole Moons. So, because I have the brain that I have, I got a moon calendar and the title charts, and I cut it all up, taped it together, right? Very technology savvy of me, right? And I just kind of looked at it, and I just looked for patterns. And what I found was, you see the full moon and the new moons on the end. The green, the green circle and the red circles, those are extreme highs and lows. And they happen in the full moon and the new moon, but only in summer and winter, that extreme. And the cool thing is our, our highest high in the morning is in winter and the afternoon for summer. So they flip flop too. And then there's this really cool thing called mushing that happens. And it only happens in the Ole Moons. My scientific word, mushing. You like it? Right? So the two highs join and have become one long low, um, high and one long low. Which is really, really cool because that's what she was talking about in that Olalo no Eau. So it was true, but it was taken out of context of season. And that's okay. We just got to put it back into context and that's a relationship. So quarter moons you see on the left, that's a low tide. And that low happens during the day, 12 hour low during the day in the spring. And during the day in the fall, it's 12 hour high and they swaps. So the things that you wanna do on a low tide in the fall, you just gotta do it at night because all night it's low tide. So when Kelly guys came up for our um, Hui and a Kapaya, Eku and a Kapaya, we, we built about 2000 feet of, of rock wall with 2000 people. It was in the fall in October in the Ole Moons, which meant all day was high tide, right? So all night the machines were running because they had to deliver rock. So from like eight o'clock at night to three in the morning, we had big machines just dropping rocks on the wall because it was super, super low. But then when everybody came in to build the rock wall, they were all underwater. It was really funny to watch. And it was so exciting, but so, you know, the, the heavy rocks were lighter, easier to roll into place. But when we look at all of the, the dynamic of the moon and the dynamic of season, again, the outside world is, is one aina, but we are also aina too. So I had to explore like, what does this mean to me? So again, I needed a tool. How do I help along this journey? So me and a friend, Naya, we built Ku'umo Olelo. And it was to help us explore our story in relationship to the moon and seasons. So again, quantitative, qualitative, all the things. We wanted to look at, we wanted to do graphing, right? Because they're easy to see, right? Patterns. And looked at physical, um, what is it? Physical, like your energy levels. 
Mana'o, which is your mental clarity. Um, Na'o, spiritual, emotional resiliency. Again, all positive words because there's no negative, right? And again, our, our rating scale. And what we came across was this. So when I ask someone to do something, I'll do it myself and I'll share. So this is my graph. And then I, with journaling, recognize three different states. And I talk to hundreds and hundreds of people. You laugh, but you can remember that, right? Cocky. We all have these windows, but guess what? They don't all fall on the same moon. And they actually kind of shift once in a while and they flip flop during different seasons, like the tides. Who knew, right? So my cocky window, guess where we're at right now? <laughs> we are rising in ole moons. Did you see the moon last night? For us, those are oles, those quarters. So the first quarter, I start to rise. My energy level goes up, mental clarity up. So I feel super smart. I don't know if I am, but I feel super smart, right? Emotional resilience goes up. So if I'm wrong, I really don't care, right? You know, the, all the things. All of us do this. I'm just being honest. And then it drops right at the full moon. And then I get a little bit precious, yeah? But nothing makes sense because when you're overstimulated, nothing makes sense right after. So it's stewing time. This is a time when you have so much information, nothing makes sense. And then there's stuff you can do there that adds to your overall health to take advantage of feeling lost while you stew everything. And then the stars alignment window. And we all have these cycles, but again, they don't all land at the same time. And then you mix it in with journaling. And so this is what our journals look like an open spread per moon phase, and you gotta find your month that you're in. And then if you do it for three or four years, because we don't journal every day, or I don't, you start to see trends, right? Same thing we did with seasons, but now we're doing it looking at our trends. And I'm sharing because we have to be honest about this. We don't get to learn if we cannot peel back the layers and be honest. Yeah, slow and steady, getting out of a slump, a bit precious, that's my keyword for like, cry all of the time. Yeah? And then I have a note, same as Mahoe Hope. So I'm seeing the same things happening over and over again through the months. And when I recognize that, now what do I do with it, right? This is the keto. Ask a question, make the observation, and now we have to answer the question. What are we gonna do? And what is my why? I know Momona. So how do I make myself productive and thriving so I can now spill over into my family and community and that can spill over into the world? So that's myself as an Aina. And that's what I look at as Huli'ia and the Moon Journal looks at as taking the system of tradi traditional inquiry process and really going with it. But then how does this fit into the world around us? So I also have a Western scientific mind. I like that stuff, yeah. Microscopes and numbers and all of this stuff, I can make sense out of it. And I know that's my skill. So again, 15 years ago, I started to look at the, um, the Opihi fishery or shoreline. How much time do I have? I talk a lot, so you have to remind me, please. Sure. Just keep going, okay. <laughs> Opihi fisheries, intertidal, and I know a lot of you guys are working in the Taiyao, right? Looking at river systems and the oceans and everything. So I spent 15 years on the shoreline. And here's what you guys don't wanna hear. It was 10 years later that I reset. 10 years. So one year projects, two years projects, five-year projects, sometimes you don't know enough to ask the right questions because our relationships were much different one year, two year, five years ago, right? And this is the difference between commitments. And I know we talked about it with several of you. Indigenous commitment is generational. It's not during funding periods. And that's something we have to accept, right? So 10 years into this, we had to hit the reset button because I understood and I started to recognize that we weren't getting to Aina Momona in our inquiry. We were looking at how much things were out there, but it wasn't supporting production. And I was taking away and contributing to conversations that took away Aina from its traditional role in our families, and that is to feed. And here's a really interesting part about it. And there's a, a reconciliation that has to happen, but MPAs, Marine protected areas and no take zones. 
I am not against them, but I'm very critical of them. Because when you take away a place's ability to feed our people, what happens? Our people don't go there. Yeah, we no longer go there because we don't have the fundamental relationship that we have with place. And then when we don't go there, what happens? All the white guys buy land around there because there's no brownies. I'm just saying, I'll be honest about it. Yeah? So not only do we change the relationship of ourselves with land, we start to change the social dynamic of a place and the political dynamic of a place. And that's hard to watch over time. And sometimes you don't see it till too late. So for me, protected areas, no take zones, are short term solutions to getting to a long term goal. Because sometimes we have to take a step back and be like, you don't know how to behave. And until you do, we're gonna stop. Hard stop sometimes. And that's okay, because we have that relationship. But we can't take away the fundamental relationship of Aina too, that we have. And then we looked at why is research getting us to thriving communities, their why? And what is driving research? And another realization that's really scary, guys, is research is driven by publication, a degree, or improving your resume. And that's super, super scary. Because guess what? If we change the why, if we do research for thriving communities, we can still publish, you can still get a degree, and you can still build your resume. But we address something greater. So we changed everything and we started to look at production, not opihi stocks, which is the limpet. It's our like favorite food. And we started to look at production on a shoreline. What are the drivers? What needs to exist to not survive? Because again, we're not interested in survival. Yeah? We're introduced we're we're more interested in the thriving. I don't want to survive. I don't want our people to survive. I want us to thrive. Again, the why. And then what are those drivers and how do we understand them? And then how do we move from there? So not all shorelines are created equal. So here's some of our considerations. We have different types of shorelines. We have different types of weather on windward and leeward sides of our shoreline. We have wave impact gradients, right? If there's a reef outside or some barrier that blocks the incoming swell. We also have salinity. We have a sweet spot of freshwater mixing that actually just blows up population and the ability for them to be more concentrated in an area. Um, sunlight exposure. And all of these, these drivers, if you go too much, it'll actually collapse the whole system. And then we have the seasonal habitat and growth. And here's what we found, graphs, lovely, right? Those, they're in pairs and they're through time. So fall on the left and the first two bars, fall, same habitat, fall and spring. They double in size. All habitats either double or quadruple in size. And then across gradients of wave impact. And on the right, on the right graph, sorry, I don't know how to do the pointer laser thingy. The left is the high impact area all the way down to low, and these are like 20 meters apart. So when we go on a shoreline, as a lot of us will go in when we're doing research and be like, ah, oh, there's a lot here, healthy. Ah, oh, there's not a lot here, unhealthy. People took it, oh my God, close it down, right? That's usually the jerk inch thing. But what, if we don't understand production, then again, we're not making the best decision for that place. And understanding there's natural die off, there's caring capacity to understand and what those drivers look like. And then po population size according to those different zones and that impact area. So it all makes a difference. Understanding drivers, understanding production, understanding all of those things. And the cool thing about this framework is it can go anywhere. It can go in our stream system. How do we understand drivers? It can go into our families. How do we understand drivers? It can go into businesses, organizations, into the forest, if you understand the drivers that boost production, then we can start addressing those and understanding those. So I just want to show you cool pictures of our river. Again, but I talked about relationships, right? So we go through this process and then I just joined a, a graduate program and we're forced to look at positionality, which is relationship. 
and now I'm 20 years into this and my relationship is different. And I had to consider other things because now it's not just about our watersheds and our natural resources. This is about our lahui, it's about our people. So I had to really talk, look at what was my relationship to my people and to the journey that we're on in healing and how we engage with people. Remember those peva I talked about? How do I not become a wedge? How do I become a peva? So acknowledging the influences of my life, my parents, obviously, right? And also the places that raised me. And I was raised in so many places, right? So I have responsibilities in a lot of, lot of places. And also my ex-husband, when you spend 20 years with somebody, there's some really big lessons. Yeah, everybody's been married, you know this. Or are married, you know there are lessons everywhere. And they're all good, actually. They're all good to understand our journey. Realizations, I know Momona, I've been using this word forever. And only recently have I been able to articulate that we need to dream and vision through the lens of surplus, not deficit. Does that make sense? How many of us look around and be like, oh, we had this land taken away from us and this taken away from us and don't have this money. It's all deficit visioning, all deficit visioning. But if we start to look around the world through the lens of surplus, oh, the world changes. I'm gonna skip cream of the cream. If you come to my session on Thursday, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Generational trauma, this is big, because I learned it here. I might cry, sorry. So here's the thing we're all facing, colonialism, right? As victims of colonialism, right? Do you guys realize that trauma exists on the other side too? Did you know that? I know we know that, do you understand that deeply? I? So I was in Awananga on the East Coast, actually. And this South African white man was part of it. We had three non-natives. He was one of them. I didn't want to listen to anything he had to say. But we temperature checked everybody. And when he spoke, this one simple sentence, excuse me, it changed my life. He said, it's in times like this where the weight of my legacy is the heaviest. <sighs> That's hard. And not because I'm too concerned about his legacy. I'm concerned about mine. What are the tools of colonialism? Education? Language? Faka papa? Yeah, that's a tough one. And or many more. I don't know about here, Hawaii. There are, pop there are communities that shame people for speaking English. Tool of colonialism. There are people that get shame for education, tools of colonialism. We divide based on whakapapa, tools of colonialism. It's hard. This is the part where I start to cry. <laughs> because I didn't see the white African male saying these words. I saw my great-grandchildren. Let that sink in. If we continue to use the tools of colonialism to gain power back, our grandchildren will say these words. And for me, that's not good enough. So my relationship has shifted into what my friend Josh Maury back home talks about, indigenous citizenry and Western citizenry. Yeah, Western citizenry, passive exclusive. We don't have to do anything to be a part of the citizenship, right, just be born. And what do we adopt in our indigenous communities nowadays? Fuck a papa, you have to be born and then you can be part of us. And yes, partially. But the lovely thing about indigenous citizenry is being active inclusive. You need to participate. You need to add, contribute. And then you will be part of the collective. So 
So I'm in the shifting place of relationship. Then about 15 to 20 years of community work, hard research in Western science, hard research in indigenous science. I've recalibrated some things, yeah. But now I have to revisit positionality, relationship, because now I'm asking different questions, as we all should be asking different questions. What does that mean? What now? How do I now diagnose differently? And how do I apply medicine? Because that's, again, what do we do? We're healers, right? A friend back home, I think he quoted his mother. He talks about it's the rigor of tradition that allows the privilege of innovation. And what that basically means is go do the work. Put your head down, go do the work. And after you've earned experience and earned the truth of your people and the truth of your lands and the truth of your ocean, then you can have the creative capacity to innovate past that. And right now we don't give and service our children and our young ones that. We tell them they're brilliant at 18 and that they have the problems of the world, the answers to the problem of the world. Go out and change it. And we don't expect them to participate in the rigor of tradition. So I wanna encourage you to gift our young people the rigor of tradition before we expect them to innovate. And then know your why. So thank you very much. I'm gonna leave you with that. And I hope you have a beautiful day. Aloha. I wasn't supposed to say anything, but I asked if I could. <laughs> so um, I think I'm lucky enough to have known Pelika for a long time. Uh, when I lived up in Hawaii, she was one of the people that I was privileged to meet. Um, and she's changed my life. And I think if you um, have taken, oh, well, I think she's probably helped to change the way that we see things in our lives today, which is kind of massive when you look at how many people are in this room. Um, a couple of things that struck me, which I've heard Pelika say this, sort of give this talk a few times, <laughs> um, but a couple of things that I knew that struck me, I think, um, were that sometimes you don't know enough to ask the right questions. I think that really hit hard when I work in research and my journey has been a lot, a one of returning to our kōrero tuku iho, and my questions have changed. And the second thing is that Indigenous commitment is intergenerational, not during funding periods. <laughs> and, um, man, why are you making me cry? <laughs> um, again, as a researcher, it is the 
fundamental thing that we struggle with when our ngako is talking about the why is that we don't ever get the opportunity to come out of those funding periods and the milestones and the requirements to think about commitment in an indigenous way. And so Sustainable Seas <laughs> um, has been 10 years, uh, but not everybody had 10 years to do their research. And I just think that for those in those positions where conversations are able to be had at a higher level to change some of that, that's, that quote right there is super important for us to take somewhere else from this talk. But I really just wanted to say thank you. <laughs> um, I quote Pelika in all of my talks all of the time, and we can all do it now. <laughs> um, but tēnei te tuku mihi, te tuku aroha atu ki a koe te kuhoa. Um, he hoa pūmau, he, ho, he hoa mau roa. Um, he here nga e kore e motukia. No reira tēnā koe. There's some gifts. <laughs> I was supposed to give you the gifts and not have a speech. <laughs> uh, Kylie has got a, a blanket made by a Māori company here in Tauranga Mōna. Oh, kia ora. <laughs> Tēnā koe. Noa Blanket Company, plug for the company. Um, and the pattern and design on that talks to Uhitai. This full body design speaks to the resilience and acknowledges our relationship with the natural environment. Can you come stand over here? I want to look at you. <laughs> She's very bossy. <laughs> the design story highlights a historical event in which Te Toka Atirikawa, which Rion mentioned yesterday, and Jack actually, a rock standing firm in the ocean is a reflection of our resilient spirit when facing challenge and adversity. The design is also a call to action to support our efforts for climate change as our resilience is dependent on the resilient nature of our natural world. Thanks for making us more resilient. Thank <laughs> you.